record button. Yeah. They told Zoom told me. You're good. Okay. Can I begin? Yes. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Mara, for the for the introduction, and thanks to the Bloomfield Library for making it possible for me to be here. Um, my name, as Mara said, is Anders Morley. And as I imagine you know, having signed up for this event, um, I am the author of This Land of Snow. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about this evening. This, this Land of Snow tells the story of a winter, an entire winter that I spent traveling alone across northwestern Canada on mm -hmm. cross country skis. Now, it's not necessarily a book about skiing. So I think, I think there's something in it for people who have never been on skis in their lives. I hope so anyway. Um, but of course, I was on skis every day, just because I think that that's the best way of moving across a snowy landscape. And so, you know, skis do figure pretty prominently in the book. And I talk a little bit about um, kind of Nordic skiing lore and the history of exploration on skis, things like that come up every now and then. Um, so it, obviously, in one sense, it is it, the book tells the story of an adventure. But there's also an important personal dimension to what I have to say. And I use lots of the conventions of, of travel writing. So I describe northern places and northern people. And I take advantage of the fact that I'm out there in the winter to reflect a little bit on win winter as a metaphor and um, talk a little bit about winter ecology and things like that. So it's pretty eclectic. Um, I hope that I've brought all these strands together in a way that has some kind of harmony to it and that works and that is appealing to, to people. Um, what I would like to do this evening is talk first a little bit about the background of uh, the journey that is at the center of the book, talk about what motivated me to, to set out on this journey in the first place. And then I wanna kind of take you along the trail with me, um, tell some stories, stop in a few places to read a little bit from the book, and as I'm doing all this, I'm going to be sharing my screen and I've got lots of pictures from, from along the way to help give you um, a visual sense of what I'm talking about. So at this point, I'm just gonna jump right over to screen sharing mode. So bear with me for just a split second. Um, okay, uh, Mara, can you give me a thumbs up if that looks good? Okay, perfect. Great, so that's my title slide. Um, I need to advance, why is it not letting me advance? Oh, there we go, okay. Um, now I knew, I knew from before I had uh, even embarked on this journey that I was eventually <clears throat> going to want to write a book about it. I wasn't sure what the book would be like exactly, but when I got back home after my four months out in the winter and sat down at my desk, I of course had to start thinking about it. And the first question that I had to address was where do I wanna start telling this story? So I kind of looked into my past for something significant. And eventually my questioning led me back to the man that you see <clears throat> on the screen right now. This is Tony Matt. And Tony Matt was an, uh, an Austrian ski racer who came to prominence in the 1930s. And in 1938, when the Germans, Nazis annexed Austria, um, Tony Matt had no interest in living there anymore. And so he decided to flee the country and he fled the country in the company of a whole group of downhill uh, Alpine skiers. And they fled en masse to, of all places, North Conway, New Hampshire. <clears throat> And when they got there, they these this group of Austrian skiers set up what became one of the first alpine ski schools in the United States. Before that time, when people talked about skiing in the United States or in Canada, they usually meant Nordic skiing from Scandinavia, so like cross-country skiing, things like that. This was this new sport um, from the Alps, this sort of high-speed sport. Um, anyway, you may be wondering why I'm talking about this high-speed downhill skier when I'm here to talk about a long, slow slog on cross-country skis. Well, um, Tony Matt 
is best remembered today, not so much as a ski instructor, but as a ski racer, and in particular for his legendary performance in a race that was run on the slopes of Mount Washington in New Hampshire, which you see on, on your screen right now. Um, this race was called the, Amer the American Inferno, <clears throat> and it was run three times in the 1930s. Uh, and in 1939, Tony Matt, newly arrived in the United States, decided to enter this race. Um, he'd never skied on Mount Washington before, um, but he decided to, to have a go anyway. The, so the course of the race went from the summit of Mount Washington, which you see kind of in the upper right hand side of the picture, down what's called the summit cone and into Tuckerman Ravine, which is that big basin right in the middle of the picture, down through Tuckerman Ravine, out the bottom, and then down another two miles through the woods to the base of the mountain. So it was four miles altogether. Um, now the, the, the record time for that race but before 1939 was 13 minutes and X number of seconds. I don't remember exactly how many seconds, but more than 13 minutes, um, which is pretty fast. If any of you have ever hiked up Mount Washington, you know, it takes many hours. Um, so to go down in 13 minutes is impressive. Well, Tony Matt showed up in 1939 and someone told him that he should be careful as he approached Tuckerman Ravine, that basin in the middle of the picture, because it was very steep going over the cusp. And then the first few hundred feet going down is called the head wall and it's nearly vertical. So whoever this was said, Tony, you should slow down, maybe take a few turns to kind of suss out the situation before you commit to going over the brink. Well, as it happened, Tony Matt either forgot that advice or disregarded it and just sped right over the head wall <clears throat> without so much as a turn. Um, and eyewitnesses to the event estimate that he hit 90 miles an hour, nine zero miles per hour on his descent of, um, of Tuckerman Ravine, which sounds impressive nowadays, but if you think about what skis looked like in 1939, <laughs> it's that much more impressive. But anyway, he managed to stay up and then ski down, speed down through the woods to the base. And when he reached the finish line, only six minutes and 29 seconds had gone by. So he more than cut the record in half. <clears throat> now, why am I telling this story? I'm telling this story because it's one that I heard frequently as a kid. My father would often take me and my brothers hiking and skiing on and around Mount Washington. And he, he never tired of telling us this story of Tony Matt's crazed descent of Mount Washington. And in my dad's telling of the story, Tony Mack came speeding down out of the woods where he was of course welcomed with you know, applause, crowds of cheering people. But according to my father, Tony was himself so shaken up, so disturbed by what he had just done because he could easily have killed himself that he just sped past the crowd, skied straight over to his car where he took his skis off, um, laid them down behind his car, backed over them and snapped them in half and then drove off and never skied again. <clears throat> so that was what my dad said had happened, had said happened. And um, <clears throat> so it was a story that I'd heard many times with this very dramatic ending and it stuck with me. And so when I started to put my own story down on paper, it came to mind. And for whatever reason, it resonated with me at the time. And I think it was because um, it seemed to contain this idea that sometimes it is possible to take our enthusiasms a little bit too far. And that was certainly how I felt at the, at the end of my uh, four months out skiing in the north. Now, I started skiing when I was five years old. Um, it was downhill skiing at first. And then uh, about five years later, when I was 10 or so, I discovered cross-country skiing. It really was an accidental discovery. I was rummaging around in my parents' cellar and I found this old pair of wooden skis that I later learned had once belonged to my mother. Um, so I dug them out and found the boots that went with them. And since they were my, my mom's and my mom was pretty small, my feet were big enough to more or less fit how to clip into the bindings and then just wandered off into the, the woods behind my home in, in New Hampshire. Um, and from then on, skiing, cross-country skiing just became kind of the way that I would 
walk around in the woods in the, whenever there was enough snow to, to do so. Um, and I often say that really my relationship to cross-country skiing has not evolved much beyond that. It's just that I now go for longer distances. But basically, it's just kind of like the early 20s. Um, because of what I was studying at the time, I uh, I needed to learn to read German and to do so pretty quickly. And so I decided that the best way to do that would be to go to Germany for a few months, enroll in an intensive German language course and just cram as much German as I could into my head in a few months. And so that's what I did. Well, when I got there, um, I met a young woman who was in the same course, uh, only she had come to Germany from Italy. Now to make a long, very long story short, um, we fell in love and became a couple. And within a couple of years, I found myself living in the city that you are now seeing on the screen. Uh, it's, it's a place called Bergamo. It's in Northern Italy in, at the foot of the Alps, but not in the Alps. Um, and we, uh, this woman and I got married and, um, I kind of settled into, to life in Italy and working just my, I just assumed that my life would be in Italy for, from then on. Um, and it was for nearly, for a dec nearly a decade. Um, but after, after maybe eight years or so there, I started to experience this kind of nagging sense of unease and I wasn't really sure what was causing it. I, I knew that I was homesick. I'd been homesick for a long time. I kind of missed the open spaces and the quiet of Northern New England. <clears throat> I missed winter, which there wasn't much of here. And there were other parts to it as well. But I figured it was just this, <clears throat> you know, it was a momentary kind of existential crisis that I was passing through um, and that it would eventually go away on its own. <clears throat> but it was while I was going through this phase that I, one day was walking home from work and uh, I walked past the newsstand and on the newsstand, I saw a copy of the National Geographic magazine. And since I like to read it, sometimes I bought a copy and took it home. And when I got home and opened it up, this picture was the first thing I saw staring back at me. Now I hadn't read the article that the picture was attached to. I hadn't even read the caption, but something about the image seemed to cry out to me, this is what you need to be doing. This is the, this is the malaise, this is the medicine for this malaise that you're experiencing. Um, now I've said something already about my longtime love of, of cross country skiing. I should also say that ever since I was a kid, I had dreamt of someday going on some kind of a long self-propelled journey. And I'd often thought that that would be like the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail, something like that, or maybe a long canoe trip, something in the summer, relatively normal. But suddenly when I saw this picture, it, it dawned on me that I could take my love of cross-country skiing and this dream of a long journey, put the two things together and go on a long journey in the wintertime on skis. And so really this is where the, the idea was born. Um, and the more I dream, daydreamed about it, the more uh, the daydreaming turned into something like planning. It wasn't long before I hit on the idea of going to Canada. An obvious choice, perhaps if it was gonna be a long journey, I needed a big place. Um, and I needed a place where winters were long and where snowfall <clears throat> was consistent. Um, the, the following winter, so there was a winter between when I conceived the idea and when I actually left. So that following winter, I spent as much time as I could on, on weekends going on overnight trips up in the Alps with my little dog, uh, whom you see in the foreground there, as company with my skis in my tent. Um, and I would think of these little trips as sort of practice sessions for this much bigger thing that I was planning. And I also spent a lot of time reading about uh, other people who uh, had explored on skis, one of the most famous of whom uh, was the gentleman you now see on your screen. This is Fridtjof Nansen, uh, the great Norwegian explorer. He was the first person to cross uh, the Greenland ice cap. And he made the most serious attempt uh, 
at reaching the North Pole that had made, been made until that time. Um, all of this on skis, of course. And Nansen wrote a lot. He wrote many books and also kept meticulous diaries on his journey. So I spent a lot of time reading things that Nansen had written and things written about Nansen trying to glean insights that might somehow be valuable to me as I planned my own journey. Now, the problem with all of this dreaming and all the scheming that I was doing is that um, it was an entirely interior process. And what I mean is I hadn't mentioned it to my wife. Um, now, it wasn't I wasn't trying to conceal anything from her. I want to be clear about that. But I was just I don't know, for whatever reason, I was kind of in the habit of daydreaming about it. And it just never really <laughs> occurred to me to to externalize it. And so when I finally did. Uh, it had become an idea that I was quite attached to. And so to my wife, it didn't sound like I was running an idea by her for her consideration, for her opinion. It sounded like I was announcing my intention to depart imminently. Now, it's hard for me to imagine my way back to that moment. And so I don't exactly know what I said or how it came out, but she's probably right. Um, at any rate, um, she was not... Uh, willing to accept this idea in any way, shape, or form. She was completely, vehemently opposed to my departure. Um, I should say a few things about her. First of all, she is um, a city person through and through, never lived outside of a big city in her life or a city. Um, she's not particularly outdoorsy, and she detests winter. Um, and so she was not well disposed towards this idea. Um, but I'm a very stubborn person. And so this kind of full frontal refusal was not something that I was prepared to, to yield to. And so this idea became kind of this wedge that started to drive us farther and farther apart. And that's a story that I tell in the book very honestly and openly. I'm not going to say much about it here, but it does go in a surprising and I think somewhat unpredictable direction. So if you're interested in that kind of a story, it's in, it's in the book as well. It's not just adventure. In spite of my wife's opposition, um, 14 months after I had initially hatched this idea, um, here I was at the bus station in Vancouver, British Columbia, with this huge pile of stuff ready to head north up the west coast of Canada and start skiing from west to east. So I took well, first I went up the length of, I took a boat over to Vancouver Island from the city of Vancouver, and then I took a day long bus ride up the whole length of the island. And then from the Northern tip of Vancouver Island, I took a 22 hour ship passage up what's called the inside passage going towards Alaska. Um, this is what it looks like. It's very cloudy and kind of dreary part of the world. It rains a lot. Um, and my destination was a city called, or a town I should say called Prince Rupert. British Columbia, um, and I'll have a map in a moment, but to give you an idea in the meantime of where Prince Rupert is, it is the last um, Canadian town as you go north up the Pacific coast before you enter Alaska. So it's Canada's northernmost Pacific <clears throat> port. Now Prince Rupert claims to be the rainiest place on earth, which they're very proud of. Um, but as we were coming into port, the, when this picture was taken, the clouds parted and it became by local standards, a, a pretty sunny day, to, which to me seemed like a good omen. Now, I didn't expect to find snow in Prince Rupert, even though it's much farther north than we are in New England. Um, it, it has much milder winters. Um, and so to get snow, you have to go either up high or inland. And so my plan in Prince Rupert was to take my um, sled and my skis and anything else that was snow related and put it on a Greyhound bus and have it freighted inland to the next town east, which was 90 miles inland. And then I would start walking from Prince Rupert towards this town called Terrace. Um, and so that's what I did. Now, by the time I got to Terrace a few days later, it had snowed about a foot and a half. Um, and it was late November at this point. And from, this, from that point on, from late November until the end of my journey in March, I would never again see a landscape that was not completely covered in snow. So I was very fortunate <clears throat> as far as snowfall was concerned. Now, another thing, <clears throat> um, when I got to Terrace, 
was I, um, I realized that I was carrying much more weight and bulk with me than I wanted to be carrying. And so I checked into a motel for a couple of days and carefully went through everything that I had kind of trying to get rid of as much stuff as I thought I could possibly afford to get rid of. So I was able to get rid of quite a bit of weight. And at that point, I thought I was ready to, to head into the mountains. Um, so this is where I basically the place where I started actually skiing. Um, my first objective was to cross a mountain range known as the Coast Mountains. Now, that's probably an unfamiliar term to most of you, but the Coast Mountains is just the, is just the Canadian name for the Cascade Range. So as you follow the mountains up from Northern California to Washington, as soon as you cross into British Columbia, <clears throat> they start calling them the Coast Mountains all the way up to the Yukon. Um, and so I was going to be crossing this 100 mile section of the Coast Mountains. It's called the Kitimat Range locally. Um, and it, this meant going up a long valley and then over a pass and then down another long valley. So this is kind of what it looked like where I went into the mountains. It was early winter, not particularly cold. It was often above freezing by day. Um, you can see from what I'm wearing in this picture, not really cold. Um, the snow, there was a lot of snow, but it was really sticky and wet. Sometimes it would be drizzling during the day. So it wasn't the best skiing. Um, I was fortunate the first day or so, first 20 miles or so, there was um, there was this trail, but a snow, you can kind of faintly see in this picture, there's this track called well, snowmobile track. And normally cross country, you may know cross country skiers and snowmobilers are not the, the best of friends. Um, but in this case, every time, I saw a snowmobile track, I was, I like would jump for joy because it meant that I didn't have to break my own trail and made my life, my life, you know, infinitely easier. So this was, on the first day, it was kind of a nice way to <clears throat> ease into things and, you know, not just have this, start having to break my own trail immediately. Um, but the, after that first day, it disappeared and I, I did have to break my, um, own trail through deeper and deeper snow as I went up into higher and higher elevation. So this picture was taken maybe two or three days in and I'm looking back towards the west where I've come from and headed uphill gradually um, towards, towards the pass. Um, now this picture here is kind of a parenthesis for those of you who are not cross-country skiers. Um, I realized that you know, downhill skiing is much more popular and most people tend to think of skiing as a downhill activity, but you can in fact ski uphill. Um, and on a journey like this one, you have to be able to ski uphill. And so what I'm showing you here is how you do that. So on the bottom of my, my right ski, which I've lifted up, um, you see what's called a climbing skin. And climbing skins are basically these pieces of fabric. And the fabric, um, has a diagonal nap to it. So what I mean is like, if you imagine a seal skin, in the past climbing skins were made of seal skin. So the seal skin, the, the, the fur, the, like the furs on the skin don't just stick straight out. They're kind of backward oriented. And so if you stick that kind of a fabric on the bottom of a ski, it enables you to slide in one direction. But if you put any backward or downhill pressure on the ski, those those fat, those strands of fur kind of bite into the snow crystals um, and create enough resistance to keep you from sliding back downhill. So thanks to my climbing skins, um, after a couple of more days in terrain that looked like this um, in real mountains. So I'm approaching, I'm beginning to approach the, the pass. Um, and to, to give you a fuller picture of the scene, there's this row of mountains on my right, like this, that you see here. And then kind of there's a mirror image of them on the, on the left, my north side. And I'm going up in between these two rows of mountains. And as the valley got higher and higher and steeper, um, the trail running up the middle of it was kind of, would get kind of choked out by all this, this vegetation and snow that would kind of slough down from the sides. And sometimes it was easier for me to ski up onto these slopes that you see coming down from the base of the mountains. Um, and so this is what it looked like up close. Um, these were pretty steep slopes and there's a lot of snow at this point. Um, I mean, you can't necessarily tell in this picture, but there was probably like, you know, six, eight feet of snow up, and up, up high here. Um, and so this heavy snow load on a steep slope is what creates avalanche danger, as some of you may know. And it was um, 
just as I was really becoming aware of this and starting to think and worry about it, because I had this, you know, 100 pound sled tied to my waist. Um, it was just as I was beginning to worry about an avalanche that I heard this loud bang five or 600 yards in front of me and the whole side of this mountain came just crumbled and came like sliding down and powder snow billowed hundreds of feet into the air. And of course it stopped me in my tracks. And I just kind of watched it slide down and watch the snow start to settle. Waited for my heartbeat to return <laughs> to normal. Um, but, you know, and then eventually I thought, oh, I, I should take a picture of this, but it was probably four or five minutes before I took my camera and you can see the snow still has not settled all the way back to the ground. So this is a lot of snow came down off this mountain and I was very glad that it had not happened immediately up, up slope from me. Um, anyway, so at that point, I just, just, my priority became getting out of there as, as quickly as possible. And I eventually made camp later that night in a place that was not the most secure feeling, but there wasn't really an, an alternative. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I want to read a, a short passage for you uh, about reaching the pass. So it was uh, it was actually two days after this that I finally reached the pass. It was it just seemed like forever before I uh, reached it. Um, and, I, and it, at first, when I did get to the pass, I was kind of uncertain. <clears throat> um, from the look of the sky through the trees, I thought there was a lake to my south. If my hunch was right, I was approaching the high stretch of land between the Bulkley River and the lower Skeena River watersheds. When the trail flattened out, it crossed a broad swath cut to take power lines over the mountains. There were no trees to delineate the trail anymore, and it disappeared. The power line swath, which I might otherwise have followed, went northeast over impassably craggy terrain. So I unhitched my sled and went searching for my onward course. The tops of young trees poking above the surface of the snow gave me the idea that the snow was eight or nine feet deep, and it sometimes slipped down into pockets among the branches if I cut too close to them. Skiing for a few minutes without my sled brought a feeling of sprightliness, reminding me of a fissure I'd seen earlier that day. I slipped along the swath to a rise with a lo long view westward so I could check the land against my map. I took off my skis and climbed a transmission tower for a better view. I could see that Top Lake, the last lake in a series striding the pass, was behind me. It meant I was on the height of land, but it was as though the trail had dead ended. By skiing east along the south side of the swath, I figured I had to hit the opening of the trail at some point. Clutching this invincible nugget of logic, I darted along the edge of the clearing, still fisher-like, for 10 minutes. It started snowing in lush, unearthly flakes. The silence imbued <clears throat> peace into every shimmering molecule of the hermit universe surrounding me. Amid the hush, Suddenly, a soundless puff of snow burst at my feet. My heart leapt, startled by the bursting thing. There was something whiter than the enveloping whiteness, levitating higher and higher. The rise morphed into flight. It took me longer than it should have to register what it was, and the ptarmigan made for an opening in the trees as if to show me that the path was there. The bird blended back into the white and was gone. I retrieved my sled, seemingly weightless now, as if I were a ghost transiting the solid world. I pictured myself as the subject of a Chagall painting, an old world skier floating upward to chase a ptarmigan across the white sky and felt almost at home in the snow. All right, so that was kind of my getting to that pass and, and actually down from the other side was kind of the first big challenge um, of the winter. And it was it was it was a little over a week, the whole process, eight days, I think. Um, but it it was one of the longest and most difficult weeks of my my life, probably the most difficult, uh, and definitely the, physically the most challenging part of the the journey. Um, when I came down, finally got down uh, the other side of the pass, I came into this little village called Telqua, where I met a couple who were about my age. 
but just by chance, I was crossing a road before heading into the interior of British Columbia. And to simplify the story somewhat, we got talking and they invited me back to their home um, to spend the night and dry off my things and warm up and have a meal with them. And we've remained friends, um, but I'm just telling this story as one of many such stories, um, people I would meet along the way by chance and completely unexpectedly, I had not planned for this to happen. Um, I, you know, I would come into little small towns, villages, like once a week or so I'd plan things that way, but I was expecting to just kind of have them there as backup or a place to receive, you know, food uh, resupplies and post offices. But I ended up meeting people in a lot of these places. And I tell a lot of these stories throughout the book to kind of inject some warmth into an otherwise cold story. Um, so after leaving, the, getting across the mountains and um, saying goodbye to my newfound friends, I headed into the interior of British Columbia, which is a very remote area. Um, and you can see on the map, it's kind of that white area in the middle of British Columbia. Now I was there about three weeks into the journey, but three weeks or so had gone by by the time I got there. And around this time, one evening, not long before Christmas, I was sitting in my tent, uh, having skied all day, very tired. And I took out my maps and was just looking at all of Canada stretching out on these maps. And it occurred to me that at the rate I was going, there was no way I was gonna ski all the way across Canada in four months or three, you know, in a winter, single winter. <clears throat> Um, and it, first, this realization was a huge disappointment to me because this was here was this thing I had been dreaming about for 14 months, and now it looked like I was already setting myself up to fail. And so I had a hard time getting to sleep and tossed and turned for hours. But eventually, sometime in the middle of the night, I was able to come to terms with this realization by shifting my focus from um, covering a specific predetermined geographical space to the idea of skiing across a season. So spending the whole winter out there skiing, getting from one end of winter to the other. And how far I got distance-wise was less important than experiencing the season. And so what you see reflected on this map is the journey that I actually made over the course of the four months that I spent out there. Um, now these, these next few pictures, uh, are just here to kind of give you a sense of some of the ways I found my way across the landscape. So it wasn't following any kind of a predetermined route. There's not like a, a long distance hiking trail or a ski trail that goes across this part of Canada. So I had to sort of patch together my own trail surrogates because, you know, I wasn't just going to be bushwhacking for thousands of miles because that would, you know, take a very long, long way. So sometimes I relied on recreational trails, um, getting across the, those mountains that I just described, for instance. And then later in the winter, there were a few spots where I can go for, you know, 30, 40 miles on a trail. But in most cases, I had to find other ways of getting across the land. In British Columbia, that meant mostly logging roads. Um, so the interior of British Columbia has very little population, but it has these vast forests that are intensively logged. Um, and in order for the logging to happen, they have logging roads and they're basically just these single lane gravel tracks that wend their way all through the wilderness. Now, this is unfortunately the only photograph I have of a logging road and it's kind of a major artery headed out to a camp. So it's two lanes and there's a power line, but usually they're much smaller. Um, and most of them are not plowed in any given winter unless they're being actively used. And so they just kind of lie under a few feet of snow um, waiting for someone like me to come along and use them as ski trails. Um, when I got into Alberta, I used the railroad. Now this, this sounds kind of funny to us in the Northeast because we think of railroads as these busy corridors, ferrying commuters back and forth. But here we're talking about cargo railroads that connect one remote community to another remote community with nothing but you know tens and tens of miles of forest in between them. Um, and very little traffic on these railroads. So a train might come by at most once every 24 hours, but sometimes not for two or three days at a time. Now in this picture, I'm coming into a town. So it's sort of a busy scene, but usually it was more like this. And of course, if it snowed after a train had come by, 
the tracks themselves would would be obliterated and it would just be kind of like skiing along a, a logging road again. And then as I got farther east, and I'll have more pictures of this later, um, as I got into to Saskatchewan and Manitoba, the northern halves of both of those provinces are entirely covered in lakes, thousands and thousands of lakes. So if you look at a map, it looks like there's as much water as there is land. And of course, in the wintertime, all these lakes are frozen and covered in snow. And so they become a great way for covering long distances on skis. Um, no matter how good a way I found of getting across the landscape, however, I never felt quite as well adapted to it as the animals I saw out there. And so this picture of a mouse track is just a reminder, <laughs> a reminder of that. Um, even this little humble mouse le leaves this really elegant track, I think. My favorite thing about mouse tracks in the snow is how you can see their tail, which normally is kind of gross. Um, in the snow, it leaves this line that kind of connects all the dots and it has a certain elegance to it. Um, we're looking here at the Peace River, which is uh, the, the biggest river that I crossed over the course of the winter. And it was kind of an exciting moment because the Peace River, it's one of those legendary rivers of the Canadian North that I had read about and heard about all my life. Um, and it's a North flowing river. So it flows North and empties into the Slave River first, and then that water cumulatively ends in ends up in the Mackenzie River and finally all that all of it goes into the Arctic Ocean and so skiing across water that I knew would end up in the Arctic Ocean kind of gave me a thrill I have to say considering the northern theme of my <clears throat> my journey um, and at this point we've crossed into Alberta Alberta was the uh, uh, um, what was I going to say is that it was the coldest part of the winter, I guess you could say. Um, it was a bit different from the other provinces in that uh, there's more population in northern Alberta than there is in, say, northern British Columbia or northern Saskatchewan because, um, well, because of gas and oil exploration on the one hand, but also because the prairie pushes pretty far north there. And so there's there are these little patches of open land where there's agriculture. And sometimes I found myself having to ski down out of the woods and onto these little bits of northern prairie where I was very exposed to the wind, which is quite unrelenting in that part of the world. And it was also January. So some of my coldest moments were spent um, in, in places like this that look in a picture pretty harmless. This is a, a snow bank take, uh, at a road crossing. This picture was taken not far from that last one. And you can see there's this sort of serrated pattern going along the top of the snow bank, which is evidence of this constant wind lashing across the landscape. Um, here again, north central Alberta, um, in a place where I was skiing along the, the railroad. And I took this picture because it captured kind of the typical atmosphere in that part of the winter. Um, the, the the scene is some houses and in Alberta I would come to like a little cluster of houses like this maybe every couple of days and sometimes they, there was a, there were people there other times there were summer places that had been shut up for the winter um, but getting back to the atmosphere um, at this point in the midwinter mid early, early midwinter there were probably like seven hours of daylight but at either end of that day um, there were these long drawn out periods of twilight. And so for much of the day, this atmosphere had this sort of pastel pink color, which was very pretty to ski in. Um, and then when, when, you know, when noon would finally come, it was just this sort of brilliant moment for a couple of hours. And then it would go back down to this muted color. Um, it was also in North Central Alberta was also where I came to the first big lake called Lesser Slave Lake. And that was my first chance to kind of ski out onto this unbounded expanse of, of whiteness, which was kind of thrilling. Um, and then here we're looking at my tent. Um, this was taken somewhere on the, on the edge of a lake. Uh, this, was, this was my home on the, on the trail. Um, the tent is, it's, it's called a tunnel tent, and it is divided into two compartments. Um, and the rear part uh, is where I slept, and in the part that's closer to us, known as the vestibule, um, 
that was kind of like my kitchen slash living room. And so I would haul in everything that needed to be brought in out of the weather and <clears throat> go about my evening ritual, which involved cooking first, which was a pretty straightforward process. I had kind of an inefficient system for doing that. Um, but then after I cooked for the evening, I had to keep my stove going for about two hours, believe it or not, to just to melt snow for into water for the following day's consumption. And so that meant like melting, filling up my pot with snow and then melting it down to like this much water and then pouring that into a thermos and then repeating that ad, na ad nauseum <clears throat> until I had enough water for the whole thermos. Very boring, as you can imagine. So I quickly got into the habit of using that time to write in my diary. Um, and I would you know, make a detailed account of everything I'd done in the preceding 24 hours. Um, and of course, those, those diaries uh, at the end became very useful to me when I sat down to write my book. Um, actually, I think I'm gonna stop on that slide for a moment. And I wanna read another passage for you. Um, this passage is from one of the, the sort of essay chapters. There are a few chapters in the book where I step away from the narrative and kind of reflect on um, what my surroundings have been making me think about. And so this is from the beginning of a chapter called Winter. <clears throat> <clears throat> like northern towns whose very existence I sometimes doubt, winter is hard to imagine in summertime. When birds peep and the air pulses with cicada song and plump leaves flutter on the breeze, it takes no special awareness to see that the earth is alive <clears throat> and even to recognize benevolence in it. The thought of ice only brings refreshment. It's an accent on the day, like a dash of pepper on your picnic lunch. The ice cubes in the cooler are delicate things to be carefully kept from melting. It takes intense mental effort to turn the world on which your very sense of being depends inside out so that those glistening little cubes that under the sun look almost like jewels become the dominant element, invading everything else, silencing the music of summer and freezing the trees into leafless submission. Your own being will be profoundly anxious until you find some way of making heat, which your vigilance will then turn to guarding jealously. The friendly summer world has become impossibly distant. The purpose of winter is to reveal weaknesses in living things. Such weaknesses are identified by a restriction of the solar energy that is fed into an ecosystem, which puts everything in it under stress. Diminished sunlight and the resulting cold are the generic stressors, <clears throat> but more specific phenomena test individual members of an ecosystem, starvation, heavy snow loads, blowing ice particles, dehydration, and ice formation, which can kill in several ways. Once weaknesses are identified, inefficiencies can be purged and excess paired away in a process of consolidating the gains of the preceding summer so that, the, so that the seasons can be seen as working together to maintain strength. Living beings that can't make do with a restricted energy input are killed without fanfare. When on clear cold days, you are skiing across a vast expanse of white emptiness and the air seems perfectly still and you can almost imagine there is nothing alive on earth except for you. You can sometimes hear wind currents tangling in the upper air. They moan, or make soft howling noises. And in so desolate a place, they seem to cry out to have meanings attached to them. But these writhing drafts have no meaning. The rest that one poet finds in silently falling snow is for another winter muffling its victim screams with a pillow. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there in the <laughs> very dark place, I'm sorry. Um, I do kind of turn it around and make it into a positive reflection for the optimists out there. Um, <clears throat> at this point, we have crossed into Saskatchewan, our third province along the way. Um, it was the, this, 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 these, the first week or so in Saskatchewan, Northwestern Saskatchewan was in a way the high point of the winter. Um, it was February now and the days were much longer. Um, and that sense of day length was augmented by the fact that Saskatchewan 
um, does not change its its clocks. And so, and I was also in um, central time at this point. So I had an extra hour. And uh, I, at the same time, I was beginning to feel very confident in what I was doing. And it was just kind of a pleasant landscape to be skiing through these fir and spruce forests and this sort of gently rolling terrain and nice soft snow, sunny days. And I kind of lost my sense of time as I wound my way through this winter wonderland. Um, we're looking here at my companion on the trail. This, uh, so my, this is, if, for, if you can't tell, this is a picture of my ski tips. My skis were made by this Norwegian company that makes touring skis. And on all the different models, they have a picture of a Norwegian uh, skier, a noted Norwegian skier. And mine had a picture of Roald Amundsen, um, some of you may know he was the first person to reach the South Pole. And in this picture, he's wearing this very stern, very serious expression. And I found that as I skied along, and sometimes I would feel you know, faint hearted or discouraged, it was enough for me to look down at Mr. Amundsen and see him scowling back at me. And that would give me kind of the kick in the pants that I needed to keep on going sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not joking. By the way, that's, that's serious. That really happened. I would talk to him and you know whatnot. Um, we're looking here at the home of my favorite character in the book, whose name was Don. His real name was Don, but his friends called him the Cossack. He was Canadian, but he was of Ukrainian and Russian ancestry. Um, and he was he was just this kind of crusty northern character. He had been a, a dog musher for a long time, and he knew the backwoods, the vast backwoods of, of northern Saskatchewan really well. Uh, he was a bachelor um, and a highly entertaining kind of raconteur. And so there's a whole there's a whole chapter in the book to dedicate devoted to just the the 24 hours or so that I spent with him. So this was his log cabin, which he had of course built himself. Excuse me, and this is the the inside. This is his kitchen, kind of the technological center. Um, and I wish I could read a bit about him, but I I I, I would think I would get too bogged down and waste too much time. Um, now Don uh, or the Cossack, um, he while I was with him, he kind of took out some maps and we looked over them together, and he made a few suggestions um, about how he thought I should change my route, and I took them to heart and made the changes. Um, and at one point it almost got me killed, but it was fine, I survived. Um, and this picture was taken after a very harrowing moment out on a lake, a very remote lake in, in Northern Saskatchewan. Uh, I had just come through the storm and been like far more disoriented than, I, than I've ever been in my life. Anyway, um, I eventually reached, came close to my destination, and I was supposed to meet a person who was holding a, a food um, resupply for me. And this guy skied out in my direction, skied out like eight miles out of town to meet me. And he snapped this picture the moment we met, and I had never been so happy in my life to see another human being, which is why I'm smiling here. Um, and we're down, we're getting towards the end here. So these next few pictures are taken out on some of these really big lakes in Northern Saskatchewan. Um, so this is Lac La Ronge. It was the largest lake I skied on over the course of the winter. And I crossed it kind of near its Southern end where it's about, it's about 30 miles from one side to the other. It gets even wider than that in the, the Northern part. Um, and so this picture is here really to give you a sense of scale. You can see that there's this black line on the horizon. Well, that is an island, not the mainland. And in this next picture, um, I'm, I've kind of tamped down this platform for my tent at the end of the day. And just in the, in the process of getting across this lake, I had to spend two nights out on the ice. And here you can see we're looking back towards the west where the sun is setting and where I've come from and there's no land in sight anymore. So it was a very big lake. Um, and this is me in winter mode with my beard. And now we're down, <clears throat> excuse me, we're down to the last couple of pictures. Um, both of these next two pictures were taken uh, outside of a little town called Flin Flon, Manitoba. Um, Flin Flon 
<clears throat> it's this pretty small town in northern Manitoba, but it is it sit it, it, the town sits on top of this massive deposit of base minerals. And so there's like a lead mine and a zinc mine and a big copper mine there. So the smokestack you see is the smelter, is from the smelter at the mine. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures just because it's one of the few that I have that shows me in action, dressed the way I was dressed on a typical day out on the trail with my sled all loaded up and, and so forth. Um, and then this next picture, the, the last in my slideshow, is from the same series. Um, so these were taken in early March, and at this point I was getting pretty tired. Um, I, uh, I felt like I had aged 20 years. I was sore all the time. Um, and so I was starting to think, and, and at the same time, like there were very subtle signs of spring beginning to creep in at the edges. So sometimes I would cross a, a stream, for example, um, and I hadn't really seen liquid water outside in several months. But now I would see like a little kind of trickle opening up down the, the middle of the ice or something like that. Um, and so I started to think about how to wind things down. Now, ever since I had first um, begun talking about this journey, like to friends and family and whatnot, um, my dad, who figures early in the book when I'm talking about some of my childhood skiing experiences, um, my dad had, had expressed an interest in joining me for a few days somewhere along the way, because skiing had always been kind of like this special bond between us. And so at a certain point, I said, Dad, why don't you come at the end and we'll kind of wrap things up together. So at this point I called him, he was back in New Hampshire. And I said, dad, start thinking about getting out to Manitoba in a couple of weeks uh, and I'll figure out the logistics of it, which were gonna be kind of complex. Anyway, so that's what happened. Um, that's kind of how the story of the journey winds down. My dad came out to Manitoba and we spent three days, the last three days skiing together. And so the second to last chapter in the book talks about that and it's kind of this warm fuzzy chapter with some humor in it, much less intense than, than the rest of the book um and that's how kind of how i finished the journey um and then after that there's a final chapter which is kind of like an epilogue in which i bring together some of the dangling loose ends and talk a little bit about how the well, some of the lessons that I learned from, from the journey and talk about how it affected my life beyond the trail. Um, and it has kind of a, a surprising ending as I, as I hinted at earlier, I don't wanna spoil it for anyone, but I would like to, to close by um, reading the final paragraph of the book. When we go to the wilderness alone, we are reminded that our human life is itself just a minuscule facet of the world. We are also reminded, especially if we go in winter, that at some point each of us is going to die. Just as the sense of our smallness next to the totality of nature can give us an ecstatic sense of participation in the greatness of the whole, <clears throat> the reminder of death built into the cycle of the seasons can sharpen our awareness of being alive. An intimacy with winter makes it sometimes unsettlingly apparent that nature is not some volitional force that cares whether we live or die. Caring is what humans do. It's why we make homes, our little refuges in the wilderness, and trails that lead us back to those homes where we find other people who care for us and need our caring in return. It is this that holds the human center and gives life that wonderful oxygenating of the coursing blood the soft, warm glow we call meaning. Um, now, one last thing I want to say <clears throat> before, before I take your questions. <clears throat> I opened with the story of Tony Matt, the Austrian ski racer who sped down Mount Washington and shattered the old record. Um, now, when, when I realized that I wanted to include that story in my book, I thought that I should go back and make sure I had all the details straight. <clears throat> And so I went and read a little bit about Tony Matt and confirmed that he had indeed broken the record for skiing down Mount Washington, but I couldn't find any mention of him running over his skis and giving up for good on skiing, which seemed a little strange to me. And so I decided to get in touch with the director of the New England Ski Museum to ask him whether he knew anything about it, and he did. 
And he confirmed uh, what I had confirmed myself, but then he said, um, well, Tony Matt definitely didn't ski over, run over his skis and he went on skiing for the rest of his life until he was an old man. And so I hate to have to be the one to tell you this, but your father obviously just made up his own ending to the story, which is very much in character for my father. Nevertheless, I thought it was a very good ending um, because it, even though it wasn't factually true, it contained its own kind of psychological truth. And so in the book, I do tell my dad's version of the story, adding, of course, that um, that's not really how things happened. And with that, I have finished speaking and would be more than happy to answer any questions you have.